what's going on in Sevastopol? It seems that the Black Sea Fleet headquarters is under attack. How important is this? Well, it's they're at war. So at war, each side will bomb each other. Remember during World War II, uh, the Germans bombed London and the Brits bombed and Brits and Americans bombed Berlin. Uh, so there, there's always sort of that give and take in warfare. Uh, Ukraine has been under a lot of pressure to try to perform and to show some progress. So they've been launching these desperation attacks in Sevastopol against, uh, you know, trying to penetrate and destroy, disrupt uh, the Russian fleet operations there. My, I don't know if there was a direct hit on the headquarters or if it was a shoot down and the missile fell into the headquarters. Uh, regardless, there was some damage. Uh, apparently, one Russian sailor is reported dead. And it doesn't change a thing on the battlefield. Not a thing. Well, the potential change is if the Russians can prove to a reasonable degree of certainty that the U.S. surveillance aircraft of Poseidon, you know, the P-8 Poseidon, uh, if that was involved in any way with passing intelligence that was used by Ukraine to launch those missiles and hit Russian targets, then I think we have the potential to see an escalation where Russia will start taking out, forcing down, or shooting down uh, U.S. Uh, surveillance aircraft or British surveillance aircraft. Uh, you know, I think the, uh, the Putin is actually probably going to come under a greater pressure to do something about that. I, I heard... I haven't independently confirmed it, but I was told that uh, Biden reversed himself today and has now authorized the deployment of attack of missiles, uh, you know, ATAC, uh, ATM, CMS uh, to uh, uh, Ukraine. If that's true, that still doesn't it's not a game changer. What well, th those missiles, I, I understand, have a range of around 190 miles. So what are we talking, 260 kilometers, roughly? And that it can only reach into Russian territory or deep into Russian uh, positions if it's brought close to the front lines. And the closer they bring it to the front lines, the more vulnerable it is to getting destroyed by Russian uh, air power and drones. So again, this is, the West doesn't know what to do. They had counted on from the outset that Ukraine was going to deliver a military defeat to Russia. They really sincerely believed that. It was delusional, but that's what they believed at the very outset. And so now they keep, you know, they keep trying to figure out how to patch them back up and get them back out on the field. Uh, you know, Ukraine's the equivalent of, of, a, of a football player with two broken legs. You know, and they're saying, get back out there and score a goal. Well, not going to happen. Uh, you know, Pele with two broken legs may have been Pele when he was alive and a, and a hero, but he wouldn't have scored any goals. And it's the same. It, it's the same for Ukraine right now. When you look at the statements of General Mike Milley, how do you see his policy toward this world? It's all politics with him. And it is delusional politics. You know, he's expressing his hope. What the United States wants, what they're now banking on, is that this can be a long war, a stalemate. Now, a stalemate implies you got two sides that are equally matched, and one side has no advantage over the other. Well, that's not the case here. That's nonsensical. Russia has, for starters, you know, six times the population, seven times the population of uh, Ukraine. Russia has intact production facilities where they can produce everything they need from uh, ammunition for, for pistols, handguns, rifles, up to ammunition for artillery shells, tanks, planes, armored vehicles, uh, cruise missiles, drones, I, you know, it goes on and on. So Russia can produce all of that. Ukraine can't. Ukraine is totally reliant upon the West to give it stuff. And the West is, you know, you know, if there's 
uh, if you have a, a charity clothing collection on your block, you, you know, on your neighborhood, your barrio, uh, do sometime, and people aren't going in grabbing their newest clothing and their best clothing, you know, they're getting rid of the old stuff. Oh, okay, I don't wear that anymore. I'll throw that out. Well, that's what Ukraine's getting. They're getting the old stuff. And the old stuff doesn't work very well. And sometimes it's got holes in it, needs to be repaired. Uh, the casualty rate that Ukraine's suffering, dramatic difference. I mean, it's it's slowly coming out that the, the numbers are well in excess of 500,000 killed in action. Uh, it's an incredible number for the size of the country that uh, Ukraine was. Um, so the, the, there is no issue where Ukraine has an advantage over Russia. The, the West's impatience, they're, they keep thinking that Russia needs to fight this war like the United States would fight the war. Well, the United States has never fought a war like this since World War II. Uh, or maybe the Korean War. And the people that fought those wars, are they're either really old or they're dead. So you don't have anybody in current leadership position within any branch of the U U.S. military that has any kind of experience with this at all. And so for them to say, oh, yeah, law, this can be stalemate. That, that's what the West wants. They're, they, they're entire, they believe very sincerely that... If they just push Russia enough, Russia's economy will collapse. Uh, they've, uh, you know, you you and I were talking before you you started going on air about that soft clay that you you have to build things on in Brazil. And they're looking for ways to stabilize it. Well, there's no way to stabilize Ukraine now. It is it it's the very foundations of its military are weak, and. It doesn't have any way to replace those foundations, to shore them up, uh, to harden uh, the underlying territory. So it's uh, it's not a stalemate. But, you know, Milley believes it. Jake Sullivan believes it. I'm sure Joe Biden, if he can wake up for a minute, will believe it. Uh, you got members of Congress that believe it. But it's, you know, it, it's, it's divorced from reality, in my view. If that's the case, why Zelensky is advocating for the continuation of this war? What he's gaining from this war? If, if Ukraine is losing in each and every aspect of this war, what he's, what he's continuing this war? All about the Benjamins, as they say. Money, 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 money. You know, remember the song from Cabaret? You know, that, that that's what he, you know, this is not about... Um, achieving some vision for a free and democratic Ukraine. Because the very foundation of this movement, the Bandera movement in Ukraine, is completely antithetical to human freedom and liberty. It's antithetical to toleration of different races and cultures and religions. Uh, it, it's, it, it embodies many of the most heinous beliefs of the Nazis. Uh, so it's a, it's a radical uh, ideology, and that undergirds what Ukraine is doing. That's why, you know, we saw we saw the Taliban some years ago start blowing up ancient statues and monuments because they felt that they were uh, idolaters. Well, you've got the Ukrainians now. They're erasing great poets, writers, scientists, uh, just because they're Russian. You know, they're it, it's if they were. It's no different than if they were going out saying, we're going to find everything that's Jewish and get rid of it. We're going to burn it and destroy it. Now, that's what the Nazis tried to do to the Jews. Now Ukrainians are trying to do the same thing to uh, the Russians. Antony Blinken tweeted that Ukraine has reclaimed more than half the territory Russia seized. Have they heard of Bakhmut? Have they heard of Solidar? Have they heard of Lysychansk? I mean, it just, you know, what they're doing, it's it's a red herring. They're looking at Russia having vacated farmland around Kharkiv and Kherson and gone back, you know, like in Kherson, they came back uh, east across the river so they wouldn't be trapped in the event of a flood from a broken dam, which there subsequently was. And they're, they're trying to say, oh, yeah, 
Ukraine is winning because they've taken back more land than Russia ever took. It's just, it's, it's a lie. It's not true. It's absolutely not true. And Ukraine's paying a terrible price. But that's what I mean, that these guys like Blinken, because that was a line Jake Sullivan used at the press conference. So you can tell they, they've written out the talking points. Uh, they've decided what, what lies they're going to tell. They're going to get all of them on the same sheet of music. They're all going to sing the same lie. And, you know, lo and behold, it'll be true. This is no different than Adolf Hitler in his bunker on April 29th, 1945, commanding armies to move here and move there, armies that didn't exist. So, you know, these guys are engaged in the same thing. It's delu it's delusional. It's crazy. It was so strange at the UN. Nobody was advocating for peace and negotiations but Russia. And yeah. the country that is getting destroyed is Ukraine, is not Russia. You're going to negotiate one of two ways. Um, an unconditional surrender on the part of Ukraine. I, I think that's, frankly, the only way that this will end. Because uh, to have a conditional surrender means that Ukraine is going to have certain demands and Russia will have certain demands. Russia is not going to give up the territory that is taken back. It's not going to return the Donetsk, uh, the Luhansk, the Kherson. Uh, uh, none of those regions are going back to uh, Ukraine, period. Not negotiable. Um, what is, is, and, and Ukraine has insisted that they want Crimea back, too. They're not going to give up unless they get Crimea and Kherson and Zaporizhia and Donetsk and Luhansk back. Unless that all comes back and Russia gets out, they're not going to settle. Well, they're not going to be in a position to dictate that. And that's why I say it's going to it's going to probably come down to an unconditional surrender on their part. Uh, Russia is just going to have to bleed them dry. Uh, it's it's uh, sounds horrifying and it is, but uh, I, I don't see any other way out of this. The, the most important supporter of Ukraine in Europe was Poland and is Poland. It seems that there are some disagreements between these two countries. Mm. In your opinion, how serious is this? Well, I think it's pretty serious. I mean, the 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 words being exchanged back and forth are not, uh, you know, love notes. The Duda did declare Ukraine is the equivalent of a drowning man and is dangerous as such. Uh, he then came out, I guess, today trying to, oh, no, no, I was misinterpreted. No, I, I didn't really say that. Well, he said it. And uh, they also said that they were no longer going to ship weapons, new weapons to uh, Ukraine. Now they're saying they're backing away a little bit from that. The, the, all of this is in Poland is being driven principally because they've got elections coming up, I believe, in three weeks. It's in October, and uh, the farmers, uh, who are still a, a significant voting bloc in Poland, have really suffered at the hands of the imports of grain from Ukraine. So it's driven down the price of grain, uh, wheat, in Poland. And so they've been, uh, they're, they're angry at the government for allowing this. So there's, you know, the domestic politics in the election in Poland is really going to be driving how much support Poland can actually extend to uh, Ukraine. Uh, they didn't say anything about whether they would uh, try to block the transit of uh, new equipment. Like M1 Abrams is currently in Poland. It would, should be going across the border any day now. So you just have to we have to wait and see what's going to happen. Seymour Hersh reported that the U.S. intelligence believes Russia has won this conflict in Ukraine. But the White mm -hmm. House and U.S. media are lying about it. Yeah. Do you think this kind of intelligence has been provided to Biden or he's not aware of this? No, they've provided it. They're just not accepting it. They're not believing it. And it's not just Biden. I mean, Blinken, Jake Sullivan, Victoria Nuland, they're, they're all ignoring it. Um, I, I, I spoke with a friend who's a military intelligence officer. He was in a briefing uh, you know, two days ago, and the the one star general, a brigadier, brigadier general, who was doing the briefing, 
insisted that Russia was going to be crumbling, was Russia was going to, just couldn't withstand the pressure, that Russia was going to fail. I mean, this is a one-star general. He should know better. He has access to the intelligence, but he's ignoring it. So that, you know, and that's that's not unique to the situation. It is, in fact, not unusual. I've seen it before. So that people get themselves locked into one worldview. This is the only way that it will, can uh, be. And no amount of facts will dissuade them from that. When you look at the face of Zelensky, when, when Biden was talking at the U.S., yeah. It was do you, why he was so desperate and sad. What's happening with him? Are are the things behind the scene are different from what we are hearing? Yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 they had received bad news at that point. I just, there were, you know, maybe he was told there'd be no attackums. Uh, maybe the, the they learned the full extent of that Poland was no longer going to be helping. In any event, they were not looking. They didn't look happy and victorious. You know, you've seen you've seen a sports team when they win a championship, when they win a game, they're not all sitting there going, you know, they're, yay! You know, they're celebrating and uh, hollering and cheering. Didn't see any of that from Zelensky. So, you know, the, the face tells you a lot. The body language was communicating volumes. Do you think these attacks in Sav in Sevastopol has anything to do with just a booster to to give positive thinking? In oh yeah, no, it was it was designed to play as part of this overall. Look with Ukraine, you know, Ukraine is really hitting the Russians hard, and you know, every time every time Ukraine does something like this, Russia just responds with a greater uh, retaliation. So there there will be a, a large. They may actually now go after some actual military headquarter buildings in U in Kiev, take them out, destroy them. Up to this point, they've avoided that because, again, they didn't want to. I think they didn't want to run the risk of killing foreign military advisors. But the gloves, you know, they may take the gloves off on that on that particular issue. We've we've seen that Putin going to go to China to this forum and mm -hmm. Belt and Road Forum. And Assad, as well, he was invited to China, is going to be there in China. And how how important is these guys didn't participate in G20. Now they're right. going, they're going to well, have... And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, we're, we're witnessing the emergence of a new world order that is not run by, controlled by, or led by the United States. G20, G7, United Nations, World Trade Organization, all of these international organizations have been set up and, and been, you know, very much under the influence of the United States. And were used actually sometimes as cudgels to bludgeon countries like Russia or Iran or Cuba or China. And, you know, these countries now thanks to the special military operation and the West response to it, they're just, they're fed up. They're not going to take it anymore from the United States. The United States has been a bully. The United States felt that it could seize territory and money at will. You know, I, I pulled up uh, the other day, the Congressional Research Service report on U.S. military interventions overseas. And since 1991, so we're talking 30 32 years now. In those last 32 years, the United States, on average, has uh, carried out um, you know, about eight military operations a year. So it's just, or, or wait, it, yeah, that's right. So it's going back to 1991. So it's just, uh, it's well over 200, uh, approaching probably 230. You know, look at Russia. How many has Russia done? Five, maybe. And those were all on its borders, all in direct conflicts re re related to the direct security of Russia. How about China? None. You know, the, the last Chinese adventure, I think, was to try to, you know, when they fought Vietnam, because Vietnam had invaded Cambodia. So, you know, my point is that 
in the United States, you get politicians frequently portraying Russia and China as aggressive military empires bent on conquering territory and taking over the world. That's good in psychology. That's called projection. Because the only country that's been doing that consistently over the last 30 years is the United States of America, not Russia, not China. Larry, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, if we look at this neocons agenda in the U.S., it failed in each and every aspect. Look at the yeah. Middle East, look at Africa, look at, look at Asia. They're right. failing, so, but they're continuing the same policy. Yeah. That's, uh, I think it was, at least Einstein's credited with it. I don't think he necessarily said it. It's become lore. But the definition of insanity is when you keep doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different outcome. Well, that that perfectly describes what the, the neocon plan, how well it's been going. Let's assume that Biden gets reelected. And Boy, you, you are an optimist, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> because i don't know because he's continuing this for for this re-election not anything no. there is no motive Dude. behind this <laughs> what do you think it, is yeah it... if the only the only way he'd be re-elected is if they stole every vote they could uh possible uh you know so he uh if, it, if it's a fair election he will not be re-elected uh, and i think you know the the day we're in a dangerous period because I think some people overseas, but sometimes I think they are overly optimistic about the desire or sentiment in the West, particularly in America, to actually entertain negotiations, that they will cut Zelensky loose and go forward with some negotiations behind the scene. Uh, I don't see Biden or Blinken or Sullivan or Victoria Newland or, um, or uh, Lloyd Austin, the Secretary of Defense. I don't see any of them backing off of their strident support for Ukraine. So when you have that kind of, they're just dug in like a tick. You know, they've firmly embedded themselves and, and they're bloodsuckers. Uh, I, I don't see them being able to lead the way or put pressure on Ukraine to negotiate. And and candidly, I don't think Zelensky's of any mind or in, has any interest at all in listening to uh, anybody from the U.S. side because uh, he views any negotiation as surrender. Uh, I think, you know, he's going to he's going to either have to be killed or captured. I don't think there's any middle ground on this. If not Biden, who else? Donald Trump, RFK Jr.? RFK Jr. Right now, they're they're totally forcing him out of this party, this Democratic Party. The control over this process, as we saw in 2016, when when Donald Trump came down the you know the stair staircase or the uh, escalator in his building in May of 2015. Very, very, none of the pundits, with the exception maybe of Ann Coulter, gave him any chance whatsoever of winning. They laughed. Oh, not going to happen. He, no way. Well, he did. He won. So the the same sort of confident predictions now about who will or will not be in place, I don't put a lot of stock in them. Uh, I think Trump will definitely be part of the picture as much as people want to get rid of him and shut him down and shut him up, uh, he's not going away. Uh, it, uh, I think RFK will gain some traction. And what we're likely to see is the emergence of at least three, maybe four different political movements. I won't call them parties, but you'll have, you'll have the Democrat Party, You'll have a fragment, a break off from the Democrat Party that will back somebody like RFK. You've got another th a group called No Labels. They're supposed they're an amalgam of Republicans and Democrats that don't like Donald Trump, don't like their traditional Republicans. So they're trying to set up something as an alternative. And then you have Trump. Um, so with that kind of split, uh, you know, it, it, I think the United States is looking 
at some political chaos next year, unlike anything we've ever seen since the early days of, of the Republic, uh, or maybe just since uh, the Civil War. You know, um, the United States is very insular. Uh, and so it, it has enjoyed, you know, throughout its entire history, not having to face an actual invasion until now. We're now being invaded across the southern border by these uh, illegal migrants. Um, but that kind of insularity doesn't help prepare you to be able to go out and interact on an international stage. And so a lot of times there's not a, not really an appreciate. We don't have the ability to put ourselves in the shoes of Vladimir Putin or in the shoes of Xi Jinping and see the world how they see it. We only see it how we see it. And that that the lens we look through is decidedly uh, everything revolves around the United States of America. And nobody else has any any right to us usurp anything that we do. Um, what you know, like what what really needs to be done now is for the United States to come out and admit, hey, folks, we've been wrong. We have been un we've been an unnecessary bully. We have tried to coerce uh, China and Russia in ways that are not appropriate, and we need we pledge now we're going to stop that and try to have. A, a respectful relations with one another, you know, particularly with Russia, because for a while, you know, the United States continues to work with Russia on the space program. And which is for since what, 2004, or at least for uh, 15, 16 years, the United States relied upon Russia to, to haul our astronauts to the space station because we couldn't. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we, we got a, we've got a real foundation for a relationship with Russia. Russia as well was very keen in fighting the Islamic extremists. Uh, it, fought, it fought a bloody war in Chechnya uh, and against uh, the Islamists. And, you know, candidly, they, uh, before the Russia, it was the Soviets who fought against the Islamic extremists in Afghanistan with our assistance. So, you know, the, from when it comes to combating terrorism, Russia can also be a friend on that. Combating drug trafficking, Russia would be a friend of the United States. You know, the, the United Russia is not in sync with the United States on the radical social agenda of recognizing transgender and LGBTQ movements as normal. The Russians have made it clear. Now, that's, we view that as abnormal. We're not embracing it, and we're not certainly going to pass laws to enable it. 